Okay, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today for our graduate group in education, PhD colloquium lecture series. Um, we are excited to have Dr. Claudia Escobar present to us today. Before we get to um, um, introducing Claudia, I wanna just remind you all that uh, we have one more session and there was an error for next, next week's sessions. I scheduled this um, Yanira Madriga Garcia session for next Monday, which is Memorial, a Memorial Day holiday. So we are rescheduling her for Thursday, June 3rd. We will be having flyers um, throughout our, our listservs to remind everyone of that. Um, but for today, I would like to, oh, I'm Danny Martinez. I am a associate professor in the Graduate School of Education in Language, Literacy and Culture, and also chair of the Graduate Group in Education. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. McCall Curlander, who is um, advisor to our, our speaker today. So I'm gonna pass it on over to her now. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Martinez. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, again, I'm Mikal. I'm happy to and honored to get to introduce um, Dr. Escobar, who has officially completed. It's been several months now that she has been Dr. Escobar. So just really excited to um, celebrate her. She's not had a proper graduation yet. Um, so um, it is my honor to um, also now um, introduce her as a collaborator and um, she'll get, I hope you get to hear a little bit about her work where I get to continue to work with Dr. Escobar through Wheelhouse, the Center for Community College Research and Leadership or Leadership and Research. Um, so just a few words about Claudia before you get to hear all about her dissertation, which was quite an ambitious um, scope. I think you're only gonna get a small slice of it today, but hopefully you can hear more about it through other venues. Um, Claudia spent, um, uh, Claudia uh, studied and um, grad did graduate work at the Harris School University of Chicago in public policy, although she's a native sort of of, of Southern California, um, um, went to McKenna, um, Claremont McKenna College. Um, among the many um, jobs she's had before she arrived um, at UC Davis as a graduate student, she spent six years as an analyst at the UC Office of the President, uh, where she got to do a lot of policy work on a variety of topics related to higher education, which she continues today, but much more um, devoted to kind of work on the ground, I think, in classrooms and at institutions than she got from her platform at, at the system office. Um, here, importantly, you should know, she did, has done really important work at UC Davis, um, with the as a special assistant to the associate vice chancellor for academic diversity specifically on the hsi task force and on institutionalizing advance which is an effort to diversify more broadly the um the the um professoriate but really from the whole pipeline um in higher education um and with that i'm going to turn it over um to claudia to, to hear both about her dissertation work and also about her plans moving forward so thank you delighted to have claudia then i'll let you take it away <laughs> thank you so much, McCall. Um, so let me share my screen here, but thank you all for coming and for showing interest in my research. Uh, let's see here. Um, hmm. All right, let's see. Share screen. All right, hopefully, is that showing up? Great, thank you. So yeah, so thank you for coming. I know we're all pretty busy. I know it's the end of the, the quarter as well or getting close to it. Um, but I wanted to um, present, uh, you know, most of what I will do today is present this paper that um, I don't know what I don't know, which is an exploration of learning experiences um, and non-cognitive factors at this uh, broad access institution. Um, but I will uh, give you a bit of um, kind of a bigger picture of, uh, oh, is that... There's something in the chat here. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, so let's see, uh, is it going? Okay, so here are the, the goals for my presentation are um, to give you kind of a bird's eye view of my dissertation, which is, as McCall mentioned, ambitious, um, and then um, present findings on this one particular paper, uh, work about my current, uh, talk about my current work, and then open it up to questions and hopefully engage more in a conversation. Um, you know, I did, uh, I feel like my dissertation is this, um, my, uh, how my research interests developed over these three um, papers. So, um, but first I wanted to do a little of, a bit of gratitude practice. Um, and I wanted to first start off by thanking the faculty at the School of Education for 
the collegial environments that they've fostered um, over the time that I've been um, in school. I'm also immensely grateful, as McCall mentioned, I went to these really two kind of highly selective institutions as well, and, and they didn't have the same diversity that we have here at UC Davis, which I'm really grateful for. Um, believe it or not, I think I had the most women faculty and most faculty of color that I've ever had in higher ed. Um, and it really changed um, how I experience higher education. And so I'm really immensely grateful for that. And then I wanted to, I, I know my, I think my com most of my committee is here and, and they've seen, um, they, uh, by now they've read the acknowledgement sections and I poured over my heart about how much I was grateful to them. So I, I wanted to do something a little bit different and, and thank, um, for instance, I don't know if, if uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Danny Martinez knows this, but he had coffee with me um, at the beginning of my qualitative uh, research work. I was thinking I had two years of data and I was thinking, how am I gonna ever look at this information? And he sat with me at a coffee shop and told me here, read this book, but also gave me all of the, the tips that I needed to actually get me started. And, and I'm a little sad that I don't see Dr. Uh, Maisha Wynn because she doesn't know this, but um, to craft my themes in my, in my qualitative paper, I actually read portions of her book of justice on both sides. So you just never know where your work is, where your work goes and takes you. And then um, I'm glad to see, um, I think I saw Dr. Patricia Quijada, but, um, and also, um, so I took uh, social justice and education frameworks from Dr. Gloria Rodriguez, and I took this uh, critical race theory class from um, Dr. Patricia Quijada, and it really does inform um, what I consider the practice of research. And, um, and I'll get to this later on about some of the partnerships that I'm building, but it also very much informs um, how I'm building um, some of those partnerships and where I might push our partners to think a little bit more about how they deliver um, classroom instruction. And so, um, and it also, in some regard, it also rounds out, rounds out um, the, the theories that I kind of gravitated to and made me think about some of the limitations of the social psychology theories that, are, that I use to frame my studies. Um, and so let me move into um, some, of the, some of this work. So my dissertation is made up of these three different studies and it's this, you know, broadly like this exploration of student learning experiences. And um, I wanted to compile evidence on student motivation and learning environments and course outcomes. So this first paper that I wrote um, is a quantitative paper and it examines this relationship between student perceptions of their instructors and course performance. And the second study, I really wanted to understand student motivations and their purpose and how they express themselves around the purpose and the goals for attending college and attaining a degree. Um, and if I could, and I wanted to find if there was any differences by demographic characteristics. And in this third study, um, I, I was really interested in understanding how students' perceptions of their learning experiences inform how they develop these, what ideas around non-cognitive factors, which are, you know, things, it's the attitudes and beliefs of how uh, students how they believe how they can learn. And uh, a lot of it is around motivation, the learning strategies, mindsets and perseverance, and, and I'll define those in a, in a little bit. Um, but when I started this work, my hope was that it would inform the building of these uh, like learning environments and support increased retention and persistence and completion rates for first-generation college students. And I'll kind of share a little bit about how that's materializing. Um, for those who are PhD students on the call, you might be wondering, should I do a three paper dissertation or should I do the book like one? Uh, for me, the three paper one, I thought, well, I really like to learn by practicing. So I thought if I build and I do three studies, then I'll be a lot better at doing research questions and analyzing data and at writing literature reviews. And lo and behold, uh, you know, as a, as a person who studies non cognitive factors, I can say that practicing, I now feel a lot more confident about writing literature reviews about uh, developing research questions. So it, it, it really did help uh, kind of shape my analytical skills and my writing skills. And of course, you know, like as I mentioned, my dissertation committee infinitely made my um, writing and analytical skills, um, you know, a lot infinitely better with what I like to say, a side of kindness. So, um, but in this, uh, so in this third, uh, this, so the evidence that I compiled in my dissertation um, for this first study, which you know we can always go back to and, and talk about it if, if we want, but um, what I found is that more positive perceptions of instructors, uh, student perceptions of instructors, 
um, when students have these more positive perceptions, they're more likely to do better in a course. And that it was partly accounted by the student's motivation to do well in the class. And uh, I did a little bit, I taught myself how to do mediation analysis, but I won't, I won't bore you with the details. Um, but for the second study, I found that students um, expressed seven reasons, around seven reasons to why they want to attend college. And a lot of it had to do as simply as, you know, I want to earn a degree, or I want a career development, or I want a, a better life, or I want financial security, uh, or I want to support my family. Um, and there was also this um, interdependent, what I call interdependent and independent motives for attending college. The more interdependent ones were where students were saying, I want to be a role model, uh, or I want to help my community with my degree. And then the independent motives are more like, oh, like I want to be, you know, I have this intellectual curiosity. Let me go find something about this. Um, by far, the largest category of responses came from uh, in this career area or human human capital. Um, and um, but I think the the what was interesting to me is that um, you know students of color tended to express themselves. They certainly wanted career development, but they also expressed themselves in these ways that talked about this interdependence that because I want to be a role model or I want to help my community um, at a lot higher rates than um, white students. And around the first generation college students, they were um, more likely to express, compared to non first generation college students, they were more likely to say that they wanted this college degree to get a better life or because they wanted to go back into the communities and be a role model or they wanted to support um, their families um, or, the, or even their, their future families. So there were these important nuances that emerged, um, you know, and for the third study, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into this one. And, you know, it's, uh, of course, it's the, I don't know what I don't know. And I had three goals or the purpose of the study here is that I wanted to understand how students develop um, or adapt their beliefs, um, their attitudes and their orientations to college. And I uh, wanted to understand how learning experiences shape these students' um, mindsets and perseverance and learning strategies, and to document this uh, by different um, characteristics. So the, the, you know, just broadly speaking, the, this, this paper examines how first-year students experience college. And these, uh, more specifically, the two research questions that I had in mind were, how do first-time freshmen perceive their learning experiences within and outside the classroom? and during their first and second years of college? And how do first-time freshmen describe adapting their learning strategies between their first and second years of college? Um, the theoretical framings, again, I, you know, I won't go into too much detail, but I did rely on you know, a myriad of, of theories, which is kind of what's nice about being at a school of education, uh, but it's, uh, you know, I relied on sociology, or so, 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 sociology, psychology, and some cultural perspectives. Under this umbrella, um, you know, think about um, literature around how institutional campus climates, for instance, um, and the cultural differences between minority and majority cultures affect students. Uh, cultural mismatch, again, is that uh, idea of individualistic versus collectivist views. And uh, more specifically, um, or more specifically, this cultural mismatch captures how higher education is conceptualized as an individualistic endeavor, for instance, which tends to work fairly well for middle-class students and less so for first-generation college students who may hold more collectivist motivations for attending college. And I really went through a lot. I didn't really want to separate my study in this like social versus academic experiences. So I wanted to really keep that as a, as a learning experience, as a construct and assume that all college interactions or like what the student interacts with the school contrib contributes to or detracts from the academic growth and the degree completion of, of that student. Um, prior research in this area found that, um, that motivational variables, um, this idea of motivation affects academic performance through the student's use of self-regulated learning strategies. And to me, that was kind of like the aha, the aha moment for me. Um, you might ask, you know, what are these strategies? Um, and it's this really messy multitude of processes that requires students to self-evaluate, you know, are, am I understanding what I'm learning? Um, the, uh, you know, goal setting, planning, information seeking. So you can kind of see how these, these are interactions with the college, uh, record keeping, like taking notes, self-monitoring, environmental structuring. So like, where do I study? 
um, and even giving themselves these idea of self consequences. So if I study, I do this, um, or rehearsing, you know, like presentations, memorizing, seeking social assistance, and reviewing notes. So it's this like really complex piece and myriad of of um, of skills that re that require you to be you know a, a successful college student. And and I kept thinking, well, how do students um, actually gain these skills or who teaches them to them or how do they, how do they um, actually attain them and, and who's more likely to attain them. So it's just this idea like research for me left this really big unknown in how students learn to, to implement these multitude of processes and, and why students choose or may not choose to adapt these skills, especially in college. Um, so for this paper, I went with a longitudinal study, which is where I follow 17 students over two years, um, and I interviewed them once, once a semester. Um, most of them were all first-time freshmen. 63% uh, were female, 50% first-gen, 30% white. Um, so there was a fairly mixed group of students. Mostly uh, these students were commuter students, um, and almost half of them held, held jobs, which, you know, it, it gives you a flavor for... Um, you know, that students, um, you know, they're not having the, like, living on campus and commuting, and, and they're just these things that are chipping away at the time that they have to do to do, to do their studies. I relied on this uh, conceptual framework to inform the development of uh, my interview protocols and how I was conceptualizing these really complex processes. Um, and so you'll find here um, in academic settings um, that this refers to uh, the students, how students view themselves or their attitudes and beliefs about learning. And, you know, from that first uh, person point of view, you know, belonging, you can think of it as like, I belong in this academic community or for the growth mindset, I, my ability and competence grow with my effort. And for self-efficacy is around confidence or I can succeed at this. And purpose and relevance is like this work has value or meaning to me. Um, and um, I was learning that through, uh, you know, the evidence in the literature is that mindsets are, are malleable. Um, academic perseverance is, encompasses a student's tendency to complete their schoolwork on time, despite difficulties, distractions, or challenges that may arise. Um, it's important for this to highlight here that perseverance really describes uh, of like various psychological concepts and processes that where there's overlap with mindsets, academic skills, and learning strategies. And uh, you'll often hear perseverance described as grit and tenacity, which you know can be problematic at times. And in this idea of like self-control, as you see here, um, when it's taken out of context, especially for uh, students of color. Um, but that's I feel like that's a whole other a whole other talk. Um, and then learning strategies, here's what I described, which is this, this multitude of pro processes and tactics that students utilize to support their thinking and remembering and memorizing and learning. And when used successfully, these learning strategies help students leverage their current behaviors or kind of like the inputs, like when they're doing homework. Um, these strategies can include activities that help people memorize facts, they monitor their comprehension, again, that idea of goal setting and how students manage their learning processes. I, I think of learning strategies as like these like metacognitive uh, pieces or metacognitive learning. And um, let's see, uh, for academic behaviors, uh, this refers to the observable behaviors of, so it's like the inputs that go into academic performance and can include going to class regularly or arriving to class ready to work, uh, doing homework or organizing class materials and participating in instructional activities and class discussions and academic behaviors are also considered malleable and shaped by like classroom context. So a little bit about uh, myself before I go into the themes, I wanted to I wanted to actually read a little bit of my dissertation to you because I feel like this is where I express myself a lot, the best or most eloquently about my positionality and kind of like my thinking at the time. Because I, I, I think I finished the study maybe like a, a year ago around or, or so. So, um, but I, you know, so let me just precursor that and say that, that the themes presented in the study um, are not meant to illustrate an ideal path towards college completion, but rather illustrate how different students based on demographic characteristics and these broadly defined academic preparation levels have different learning experiences within the same university. Um, my own learning experiences as a working class first generation college student of color 
that uh, eventually graduated from these two predominantly white and highly selective universities influenced how I analyzed the data. I was very much informed by my own lived experience in that way. Um, so for each of the themes that I constructed, I was aware uh, that I was coming in with these with a hypothesis, for instance, and that the, the potential for this confirming bias. And so so I, you know, I took the that book that Danny gave me and it talked a lot about disconfirming evidence. Um, so I, I sought a lot of disconfirming evidence in uh, my data. And so and so to bridge these incongruencies or where the data contradicted itself between like my hypothesis, like the evidence and, you know, taking both confirming and disconfirming, I kind of constructed these emerging themes and um, I constructed my findings to illustrate the different study tools and the stepping stones available to students accounting for their prior academic training and familiarity in using study tools. Uh, I think this was to me most notable for uh, how I presented my findings uh, for one of the students. Um, and um, her name was, I called her Anna in my, in my, um, my paper, um, who was designated as an academically unprepared student, but decided to pursue a chemistry degree, which if you know anything about chemistry, it's super difficult. Um, and she struggled um, and changed to biology at some point. And uh, towards the end of the two years, her GPA was not quite a 3.0, but she, she was pushing herself to adapt and adopt all of these new learning strategies and, and, and is, was persevering, and she's, she, which speaks volumes of her mindset and effort as a college student. And I feel like I could have really easily labeled her as having less self-efficacy or you know, perhaps maybe even a slacker of sorts, I don't know. But compared to the other students in the sample, thus like, you know, for instance, like using this deficit thinking to form this like neatly constructed narrative of less versus high self-efficacy as producing low and high performing students, which is often the case, you know, it's hard to, it's often the case in quantitative research that you construct these different um, uh, categories. And so, but however, like my goal in analyzing um, this data, oops, so the goal in analyzing this data was to kind of to show uh, phenomena as intersectional and um, as as dynamic. So just to remind you, the purpose here was to understand, you know, students developing their beliefs, understanding their learning experience and how they shape their mindsets. And are there any demographic characteristics or differences by demographic characteristics? And um, so I'll share, so I came up with these four broad themes and I'll, I'll do two of them today um, and then jump into what I'm doing uh, as for my current work. Um, so many of the students in this sample, for instance, expressed this ease in their transition to college and many highlighted um, how their high school preparation had prepared them for college and that these higher preparation levels help them adjust and adopt new study skills and strategies with greater ease. So it's just their adjustments were just that much quicker. And you know what this looks like over the two years, for instance, is students in the first semester talking about um, you know, the different uh, assignments that they were getting and, and saying, oh, I've seen or done this before, um, but also talking about how the instruction when it was done well was also helping them in their first semester. And this was a lot, this was true of students who maybe started a little bit more academically fragile. And in the second semester, a lot of the students talked about how classes are were, were somewhat easy at times, or that they felt that it was manageable, but that they were still kind of adjusting. And then by the by the fourth semester, um, they were really talking a lot about adaptations of learning strategies and continuing, um, a lot of them had decided, you know, to stay on campus more often, even though they worked. So they were finding ways to structure their own time so that they could be uh, more successful in the classroom um, and, and a lot of time management. Um, these are some examples of the uh, quotes, for instance. So in this, you know, what this looks like from the student voice, like in the first semester, this one student, again, pseudo names Adam, um, is, you know, I had asked them, like, what's your best, uh, what was your best assignment? And they were like, well, definitely the first essay, because that was actually my first college essay that I've ever written. And I've ended up getting it back with 91%. And that's kind of a confidence booster. So here's the word confidence coming up, especially after the midterm, which I didn't take that seriously. And I took a lot of the concepts I learned from my school 
for my AP literature class and I used the format that my teacher usually gave us. The essay wasn't difficult because it was none of our own ideas. Um, and then, you know, again, you know, we have another student who was a little bit more, who had come in with a little bit less preparation. And, you know, she's talking about the same assignment. And I feel like I did my best on that one, you know, the writing assignment, just because I feel like I'm way better at writing than philosophy. And I'm halfway confident. So she's already, it's only her first semester. And she's already saying, I'm halfway confident. I'm just like, oh, please stick with it. Um, and I have my days, like, I'm like, a, I should just drop out of school because of this class. Then I'm like, no, I shouldn't. I think going to class supports my confidence level. He's a really good professor. So I feel like when he explains it, I'm like, okay, I can do this. And, you know, so it's like these really poignant moments with these students. By the second semester, she's like, I'm actually very confident. So she's already like, you know, feeling feeling good about what she's learning. And I feel like I've been on top of it all semester. Now I study the night before. So she was cramming a bit. She still doesn't know quite time management. She was before I would try to cram everything before the exam. But now that I am taking less units, it is way easier for me to prepare for the exams. I actually get time to study and I get to actually pass. So this semester I'm going to try my hardest to study. Um, and she goes on to say, I need to pass. I need to keep it up. I feel like just because last semester was my first semester in college. So I feel like I was adjusting. So she's just adjusting. So now I feel like I know what I need to do and how to do it. Um, and then I'll go into the second one, which is again, this is tying belonging, not just to having students feel that they belong in the classroom, but how do you get them to feel that they belong? And it's, um, I constructed this theme around this in, this idea of an enhanced that belonging can be enhanced by faculty student interactions and that when students believe that the faculty want to help them learn um, and when they learn and do well, the students feel that, that they belong. Um, so what is, you know, what does this look like from year one, a lot of the students were talking about instructors that help me learn value me as a student, but ultimately I'm responsible for my own learning. And when I learn and do well in my classes, I feel that I belong. The, the other side of this, um, I'll capture here this idea of like sink or swim classes um, and what that what that means to belonging. Um, this particular student says, I don't feel particular, I don't feel welcome in this class whenever professors don't care. If a professor, if a professor ever brags that the class is hard to pass, I'm like, we're all in the class and we're not here because we don't care, we're all trying. I feel like professors are just like, you're just going to struggle. They just kind of lecture at you and it's like either you're going to get it or you're going to fail and they don't really care one way or another. And then, you know, again, you know, the student Anna who has been struggling, you know, by the by the last semester that I spoke to her, you know, she's going to office hours now every day and getting on, you know, she's like, I, I go to office hours and any little question I go, it has actually helped a lot. In one of those interactions, the professor was like, maybe you should take a study skills course. And she had gone and learned a lot of different study skills and was employing them. And, you know, I spoke to her and she was, I keep three different planners now, she said, you know, one on my desk, one in my backpack. And so she's trying all of these different skills to try and learn how to how to do college. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll pivot. Most of the time, you'll notice that, um, you know, we have a discussion and implication sections. Um, so I'll, I'll skip that today and maybe discuss it as my discussion and implications coming to life, so to speak. Um, so I'm currently working as a research fellow at Will House, uh, which is the Center for Community College Leadership and Research. And um, as you are familiar with the center, you know, uh, there's a network of CEOs um, that come every year um, and they learn from one another. And basically, you know, we try to help them be better presidents and chancellors of community colleges. Um, and many, much of this happens through the development of, this, of these networks and peer-to-peer -peer learning, but also making research digestible and accessible to practitioners. And um, Again, this, uh, you know, the, over this past year, I've uh, built, uh, built partnerships with three community colleges to pilot the use of a tool that actually allows faculty to regularly assess uh, through the semester how students from different backgrounds are experiencing their classroom. So it's very much of, like my dissertation coming to life. Um, and the tools uh, survey, you know, students' perceptions of key learning conditions. Um, what I like about my work is that instead of, um, you know, uh, looking at the students, we're actually looking at the environment and like the, what the faculty are actually doing, which is, which is, uh, which is, is uh, really helpful. And um, so some of these learning conditions, you might wonder, what are they? And it's uh, belonging, identity, safety, an institutional growth mindset, and 
I'll give you a flavor of this, which is for identity safety a student may answer a question about like, I worry about being judged negatively based on my group membership. And it offers race, gender, um, social class, and or institutional growth mindset is this instructor seems to believe that students have a certain amount of intelligence and they really can't do much. And I think a really important one is this idea of social connectedness, because you can see how this really plays into how students are able to kind of build, uh, you know, their social capital, cultural capital, or these skills. But one of the questions, uh, the social connectedness uh, learning condition is in, in this class, I can rely on other students for academic support, or I receive clear and academic feedback from this instructor. I can communicate with this instructor about the class as needed. Um, and so the tool the provides the faculty member with a report uh, at the end uh, at the end of these survey cycles, and based on the report, they get to go to a library of practices, uh, which has teaching strategies for how to communicate with students to produce more welcoming environments, but also provide um, academic feedback in ways that doesn't discourage students, uh, but may rather you know instead normalize some of the struggles that come when um, you know when the class material has, has high expectations or the faculty members has high expectations. Um, I'm also have been kind of, it's such a privilege, um, kind of looking at Susanna and smiling, um, that you know we've constructed a, a survey tool to help community college leaders assess faculty and staff perspectives on racism and equity and their comfort levels and their skills to engage in difficult conversations about how race and racism and bias show up in hiring practices or other, you know, other structural barriers on campus. And we're currently working on analyzing data and writing um, to document how community college presidents and leaders are growing in their own skills and responding to the pandemic and the disproportionate effects on communities of color and working class communities that, that have happened. So it's very much, uh, you know, if I had ever wanted to uh, have my dissertation come to life or had, if I was ever wondering what structuring learning environments is about, I feel like I'm in it um, and I'm in it to win it. So um, I'll stop there and allow for questions, remarks, you know, anything. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much for sharing your work. And I want to open up the space now. If you have a question, please feel free to unmute or um, so you can write a question into the chat box. Gloria, go ahead. Um, so hi, Claudia. I really appreciate your work. I'm so sorry I was late. I was trying to respond to some students. Um, and so I, I wanted to, um, gosh, I was, so, I was so intrigued by so much of what you shared. So I wondered if you could, um, like, I, I tried to take down a note. Oh, it was theme one. Mm -hmm. And it was Adam. And Adam makes a statement that I wondered if you could help us understand further and maybe unpack it for us. Um, so there's a statement there at the end where it's like something about like the, that it was none of, none of our ideas. And so that there was something about the ease of the work um, or the confidence of the work and that, and that that was kind of like how, how they ended it. And then the, the other thing I wondered if you could comment further on like how you're sort of, you know, interpreting um, the students, um, you know, who are so-called struggling. Cause there's one, I think you said Anna was struggling or Anna was struggling and yet there's so much agency um, being reflected in her actions on her own behalf to try to succeed, like going to office hours. I mean, I, I don't, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to encourage my undergrads to just come, <laughs> just come mm -hmm. to office hours. Um, and, and they just won't do it. Even the ones who are doing well, they just won't do it. So, so both of those things, I mean, I just wonder like, what did, how did you interpret Adam's statement that it was like none of our own, our own ideas and that that somehow made it I don't know, like a space for, for them to be more confident or more, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that was that was striking to me. Yeah, I mean, I I still there's so the data is so rich. And so my initial read of it was none of our ideas. Um, 
and knowing other things that that at least Adam said is that the first uh, those first few classes are introductory and at some regard they're being asked to kind of pr practice writing but they're but they're not um, so they they get to practice some of this the mechanics of writing but kind of devoid of you know the connections to to their own kind of you know experiences although they the class that we started that I started off with was a philosophy class so I recruited all of my students from that particular class and the professor did go through many lengths to make the class material relate to the students but when it came to the actual assignments um, I think because it was like the first writing essay I suspect that the professor didn't want to make it too difficult for students is my is my 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 read on it um, but there were other things that that uh we're tripping up the students in other ways. Um, in terms of s struggling, um, you know, I, I, when I think of Anna as a student, um, I actually, she was very intimidated by the faculty as you were, as you were describing. So, you know, I don't know quite how to paint that picture without not saying struggle. Um, it, it wasn't that she was struggling with her own um, skill set, but she was, I, she didn't quite, uh, you know, these classes are, well, the classes she was in this first semester were huge, like they were, you know, 100 students. And so I often wondered if the struggle was more about, you know, the environment, she was struggling with the environment, um, and not really knowing what to expect. Um, and, and one of the few students who actually lived on campus and spent a lot of time in her room, not going out. And I found that to be, like you're saying, you know, problematic, like, can't, like go to office hours. Like I felt like being like, go to office hours, but I was like, okay, I'm the researcher right now, so I can't. But she it. did, but she did. And but, she eventually, she did. but she eventually did, yeah. yeah. I think it, it, took, it, I think it, it took that first semester for her to feel yeah. like she was passing her classes. And then she slowly started to come out of her shell, but she was actually experiencing a lot of anxiety. Yeah. One of the things that I think has been helpful to me that I've learned from, you know, just working with teacher educators is mm -hmm. to the specificity of language, particularly in describing student experience. And mm -hmm. so I feel like um, because what happens is that we can't, there's a danger in lapsing into this sort of like deficit descriptions that somehow struggling becomes an innate quality of Anna as opposed mm -hmm. to Anna is struggling with the large class sizes, the learning environment. So I'm so excited for you that you're moving into now the ability to look at the environments and look at what faculty are doing as opposed to only seeing the student perspective, but but that you started with the student perspective, which I think is powerful. So yeah, yeah. 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 I congratulate you on your work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the question uh, were any of the findings surprising to you and are informing your research going forward? And I think what you just said, actually, Gloria, is probably a big, a, a big piece is um, that, again, we've, you know, over the years, especially being at the School of Ed, it's been really instructive to really think about, you know, who is the focus, who is the lens? For the research and and I'm grateful for starting with the student perspective and I'm also really excited about pivoting. So the, the finding to me is um, that was surprising is is actually not particularly in you know it's been a while since I looked at this so my first instinct is that the combination of the student experience and what I'm doing now is the interesting finding is that just pivoting just makes all that that difference. Um, I'm trying to think, I would have to say that one of the things that was surprising was um, how students, um, what gets students to come out of their shell. Uh, I still don't feel like I have a good understanding. Um, I felt that students who came into the college with friends were a lot easier had a greater ease. So it's like the more that students multiply their friends or go out and put themselves out there, the more they're likely to accrue some of these skills through their peers. Um, I think some of the quotes that I still kind of, you know, every once in a while keep me up at night is that the students who actually were doing the best 
in the classrooms were the, probably the ones that were the least likely to want to help other students. Um, and that was to me really kind of saddening because, um, you know, there were other students who weren't doing as well, but they were like, oh, someone asked me a question, like, and I want to share what I learned. And then they would share it and then there would be an exchange. But there were just, you know, the, the higher performing students were also, I felt, you know, talked about, um, you know, either talked about not being able to keep up with other students who were doing better than them, or they were like, I don't want to waste my time helping other, <laughs> basically helping other students, because I'm trying to like, you know, do better in my courses. So, you know, I thought that was, that was kind of sad to me and, and somewhat surprising to, to hear them make that calculation, I guess, was, 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 was surprising. We have a question from Paco, Mr. Matoras. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Claudia. Um, a great presentation. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, your positionality as having gone to like a very um, selective, you know, well-resourced um, undergraduate institution and then kind of like the contrast with that, with the, um, the circumstances um, with the students that, that, uh, that you were, you're working with and kind of like how that, um, you know, how that helped you think about the, the, the data that you collected. Yeah, I mean, gosh, like I, you know, I, I would probably say that most pressing or that leaves the most um, kind of in, in, indentation or whatever you want to call it. Um, maybe my undergraduate experience because of the just the stark difference between, um, you know, I didn't share, I, I grew up in Pomona in Southern California. And um, I went to Claremont McKenna College, which is 15 minutes away, but a world's difference. Um, you know, when I was used to sit in classes where they would say, don't go below a certain freeway, which is where my family lived. And it was just this, you know, walking around just felt so, so hostile. And I didn't really understand it um, until maybe when I was, when I started feeling like a, uh, you know, people were discussing like the car that I was driving, for instance, like overhearing people talk about the car that I was driving versus all of the other nice cars that were in in the classrooms. And, and but also, you know, where people had gone to vacation the summer before. And I was like working at a factory with, you know, my mom and stuff, whatever. So, you know, all of those things, you know, they seem they seem uh they, you know, we know now that it matters, but it, how does it matter to studying? Like, how does it matter to accruing the skills and having students feel that they're learning what they need to learn, but also the confidence and in, in being able to become part of that fabric of the institution. And so I feel like a lot of those experiences that I had in undergrad and sometimes even in my master's program, even though I was a, a bit, you know, I had already worked enough to be, you know, somewhat middle class, I guess. Um, and it was just this, these exchanges in which you're talking about one thing, but underneath it, there's sharing of knowledge that's happening. Um, and it made me really look at when I was listening to students talk and listening across different students, given their, their own positionality, then I, I, could, I could see that there were just all of these different ways in which students choose to interact with one another based on these different factors. Um, you know, and but again, you know, I was looking for uh, this disconfirming evidence when I could, you know, I'm like, am I just confirming my own bias? So I don't know if that answers your question, Paco. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Any other questions for Claudia today? I know there's a conversation on the thread by Maciel. Mm. Yeah, this, the individualism piece, I mean, it's, a, uh, it's for, I'm still, I still think about this. Um, and how can we not make it individualistic um, when so much of the teaching or the, how you learn is also, there's a tension, you know, you, you learn by studying on your own and then you have to go out and kind of reinforce the learning with other people. Um, so, yeah. Ah, the surprising finding, okay. Do you want to say more, Maciel? I don't know where. 
Sorry, no. Um, I I was just uh, commenting uh, or um, making a a follow up uh, of the surprising finding that you had about um, you know what kept you up at night. <laughs> the yeah. students who were achieving um, you know maybe getting the best grades, um, if that's what we're calling achievement, um, but not really uh, helping their peers, um, and and how that is in some ways they were um, like when, when I look at tr any transition, right? There's like transition to middle school, transition to high school, transition to college is what we're talking mm -hmm. about here. There's both the, the kind of the developmental needs of the individual and then the, the environmental conditions that might meet the needs, right? So then the, in this case, um, it really reminded me of that, right, that stage environment fit where if the environment um, um, uh, values and rewards um, that type of, you know, self-regulated learning that is very individualistic, mm -hmm. those, those are the students who are going to adapt better. They're going to match that environment the most. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, Whereas a mismatch, right? That's where you see the the kind of the struggle and the in that initial uh, stage. Um, so I guess if if you were you know following following up on the implications and the the, the awesome work that you're doing now and you'll continue to do, um, wondering what what you think um, uh, would be the you know is the take home like do do the environments need to be more collectivistic does it need to be a mix does it you know uh, does how we value or you know what we evaluate the assessments etc like what does that how does that need to change yeah I, my first inclination around the structuring piece um is it made me think of the library of practice that is available to, um, to the faculty members in this pilot that I've been working on. And one of the practices there is how to get, uh, how to help build more connections among students um, in the classroom and, um, and building community. And what's been interesting is that um, some, some of the faculty are kind of like, that's not like, it's out of my control. Like, how do I get students to build? And there, there are some ideas. So there, there is a possibility to do that within classrooms. Um, but the, the, I, the machinery of higher ed is just so much more, you know, there's, I, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the rankings, you know, and, and um, that they're so, you know, how we lead or how we position institutions to go forward or what, what the goal is, um, you know, that's, we haven't really made peace with, with that in higher ed, or at least there's a lot of different goals and a lot of different rewards, um, you know, that affect, I think, how, how things are taught in the classroom or what is taught in the classroom and what the rewards are. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Probably it doesn't. It, it wasn't a question, it was just more an invitation, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate all your work. Fantastic. I think everyone here enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I want to um, thank you for um, presenting your work to our community here. And I want to thank the, the rest of you all for joining us today. Um, a quick reminder that next week we are going to have a change. I said this at the beginning, um, we will not be meeting on Memorial Day. Um, thank you to Dr. Rodriguez for making that uh, making this oversight apparent to me. But we're going to move uh, Yanira Madriga Garcia session to Thursday, June third at twelve ten p.m. You will receive um, emails about this. And um, again, thank you for joining.